Amen. As you know, last week I gave a message on um, why families are failing. And today I want to follow up with another message, a little bit different than I usually preach, but uh, I'm still talking about the family. I want to answer this question, why God hates divorce? Why God hates divorce? Amen. Um, we're going to be in Malachi chapter 2 today where he claims such. He says he hates putting away. Amen. We're going to look at why God hates it. Why we believe anyways God hates it. And my encouragement is to anybody who's having marital troubles to not seek divorce. I personally believe that just about every situation can be rectified without getting divorced. I do. Even uh, adultery. Um, even, I guess in some cases, timeliness of physical abuse. Alcoholism. Um, blowing all the money. You know, whatever. Whatever the problem is, I believe that God can fix it without us having to get divorced. As your pastor, I will never counsel you to get divorced. I just won't. I've, I've seen God do too many miracles. When I think of Hosea in the Old Testament, God worked it all out for him and he gave him grace. I am just against divorce. I hate it. And I hate it that it happens to people. And you all know our stands on, stance on divorce here that we, we believe in an innocent party. Amen. We do. But still, that doesn't make God hate it any less. So, let's begin in Malachi chapter 2, beginning verse 11. He says, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet you say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet it is she, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. So he's saying two things here. Number one, don't marry outside the faith. It'll destroy you. Amen. God makes that clear. Another one is, is don't deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. Okay. Verse 16 is our text. He says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. The Lord hates divorce. You know, it's obvious that God intended marriage to last a lifetime. Marriage is of God. It's for His glory and it's to show His love. Amen. It's a blessed picture of eternal life offered by His grace. As a matter of fact, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. Let's read something there very quickly. Romans chapter 7. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. 
In 1 Corinthians 7.39, we see that the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. And if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. God hates divorce. You can tell by what we've read. However, divorce is epidemic today. It's epidemic in Christian circles as much as non-Christian circles. And then I think about about five years ago, it finally hit that all the churches are suffering more than a 50% divorce rate just like the world is. Have y'all noticed that? Y'all have heard that, I'm sure. In Matthew 19, 6, Jesus said, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. Now just think about that just for a second. When you get married, you're one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, I'm not railing on those who have been divorced today. That's not my goal. I believe there's forgiveness of sin that's available through the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe divorce is the one sin that fundamentalists have made out that that cannot pass through the blood. Have you noticed that? They never say that, but that's how they treat people. And I know that preachers will have varying opinions on the matter, but I want to stick to a simple theme uh, and not get into justifying divorce. And the simple theme is this, why God hates divorce. Why God hates it. So that's what I want to give you this morning, just a few points of why God hates divorce. Obviously, it's of the devil. It's of the flesh. It's of the world. Uh, it's obvious of why God hates it. I don't. I don't think we have to explain the fact that God hates it to this crowd right here. But I want to talk about why God God hates it. Amen. For point number one, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five, and I'm going to begin reading in verse twenty-two. But before I begin reading, let me give you my point: why God hates divorce. Number one, because it destroys the beautiful picture of Christ and His church. Right. That's why He hates it. It destroys what Christ has for His church. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of His body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You know, it's interesting. Um, what, what if our relationship with Christ was the same as with our family today? That we... Um, we're not submissive to Him. We did not allow Him to teach us and to guide us and to love us appropriately. You know, if we followed this text in our marriages, there would be no such thing as divorce. Amen? If we followed this text. If we have a divorce, it's because someone or both are not following this text. Can I tell you that it was not easy for the Lord to redeem us? But yet He stuck with it. It's not easy to be married sometimes when we're dealing with the personalities of two sinners with their own depraved, sin-darkened hearts that are come together by covenant and to try to get along. But I thank God, through the grace of God, that salvation can change men's hearts and we can work and stick things out and we can make things good and love each other 
more than life itself through all eternity. It can be wonderful, but people won't stick it out. I don't know why they even get married these days if they're just going to get married and at first trouble comes along that they divorce or it gets too hard for them. I wonder how Christ felt when He said, Father, my God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? I wonder how hard it was for Christ to carry that cross up that cruel tree and to be laid down on it and into the hands of Gentiles to be spat upon and nailed to a cross and hung on the same. I wonder how hard that was for God. You say, well, preacher, I don't know. You don't know how hard this man is to live with. Preacher, you don't know how hard this woman is to live with. I want you to know something that Christ stuck it out and worked it out. And He is making us a spotless, clean, pure bride to live with all eternity. Folks, when Christ takes over the new Jerusalem and, and has it and we're there as His bride, it's going to be an eternal honeymoon. Amen? I want you to know that we ought to stick it out because we're destroying the picture of Christ and His church. I want you to understand that solid families build solid churches but yet solid churches build solid families. Amen? We've got to have both. Don't get a divorce. Try to work it out. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time. Amen? So number one, why God hates divorce is it destroys the beautiful picture of Christ and His church. Number two, I believe God hates divorce because you have broken your vows. Amen? Vows before God are holy. We stand before God and men and exchange vows of love and lifelong devotion. No matter what reason we were married, if we were married because of fornication and pregnancy and had to get married, quote, or because we were fooled, we thought it was a different person, this and that, it doesn't matter. You stood before men, you stood before God, and gave vows of love and lifetime devotion. God is not pleased with the breaking of vows. It brings a curse down onto the heads of men. Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Don't say, well, it was an error. It was a mistake. I'm changing my mind. It don't work that way. We heard a message. Um, were they the Rechabites? The other night, Brother Wilson preached. And their father, actually grandfather at the time, said, as far as me and my tribe, we're always going to dwell in tents and we're always uh, going to abstain from wine. Well, guess what? Then the grandfather, the son, or the grandson, the son, all of them, they said the same thing. Some of them weren't even there. The vow was so important that their family maintained living in tents and they would not drink wine. Because the grandfather made a vow. Amen? Listen, God is serious about vows. Amen? Proverbs 20 and verse 25 says, It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy, and after vows to make inquiry. It's a snare. It's going to lead you to divorce. It's going to lead you to failure. Never make a vow if you don't know what you're getting into. Amen? Because it's going to be a snare to you. God hates divorce because you broke your holy vow. Number three, God hates divorce because it brings reproach to your name. Amen? I don't care what the reason is that you've divorced, whether you're the innocent party, whether you're the guilty party. It says, for one covereth violence with his garment there in our text. What I'm trying to tell you is though we know some people are innocent in divorce, there's still a stigma that follows them throughout their life. It's a life of distrust. It's a lack of discipline. It's, it's a stigma of being weak. It's a stigma of being fearful. Amen? That, am I right? 
when someone has been divorced, do not men look at you like you're tainted. That's why God hates it. Amen? Because you may not have been tainted. It may not even be your fault. You could be an innocent party. Doesn't matter. The stigma still follows, doesn't it? Amen? God hates that. God hates that. That's not righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's a stigma of violence being covered with a garment. Amen? Let me move on. God hates it because it brings reproach on your name. Number four, God hates it because it damages other people that you love. Divorce damages other people that you love. Number one, it hurts your testimony. Ephesians 5.10 tells us to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. It hurts our testimony when we're divorced. The world sees it that way. They say, oh, you're divorced. And automatically, I'm not going into the reasons. I'm not going into the justifications. I understand some people are divorced against their will and so on. Please don't think I'm jumping on people for that. I'm trying to point out a fact here today as we preach about families and we're trying to build strong families here at Old Paths Baptist Church. I want to make sure we understand God hates divorce. That's all I'm trying to get across this morning. And it's because it damages other people you love. It ruins your testimony. Yep. Let alone your kids. Yep. You know what's interesting about the children is they usually get end up being pulled between the issues of the other parent. That's, that's a sad, pathetic shame. But that's the way it is, isn't it? God hates it. God hates it, number five, because it limits your service to God. There will be a sense of limitation by other believers. Am I right? I mean, just simple things that that you have to deal with, like, well, can a divorced man pastor be a deacon? You got, It wouldn't even become a question if you weren't divorced. But because you get divorced, now that becomes a question. See, and in most people, what do they think about that? They see a divorced man and he wants to serve God in any capacity and say, oh, he'd be such a great service servant, but he's divorced. Isn't that how they treat you? See, God hates that. God hates that. God knew that when a divorce happens, He knows that that's going to happen, that people will end up being limited to their service to God in churches because churches most of the time don't even know how to handle divorce. Number six, God hates divorce because you'll suffer regret and guilt. Do you know when God saved me, He took away the guilt and the shame of all my sin. He doesn't want me to suffer that. But when you get divorced, whether you were lost, whether you are saved, both parties will be stricken with the what-ifs for the rest of their lives. I do want to tell you this. If you've been divorced and you're suffering guilt and the what ifs and the damage you've done to other people and things like that, I want you to know something that the devil wants you to feel that way. Not Christ. Amen. I want you to know something because you've been divorced does not make you a second hand citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. It does not. Because I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot worse sins that bring down a lot worse pain and a lot more uh, reaping what you've sown than divorce that men commit, but they seem to be overlooked compared to the divorce, don't they? God doesn't want you to feel guilty. You turn that thing up, you pick up the pieces, you go on, you serve God, you, you got forgiveness for that thing, and you move on and serve God. Amen? Don't don't let that pull you down. Don't let guilt ride you like a monkey on your back. Amen? God doesn't want you that way. But God hates it because He knows. He knows about the guilt you're going to bring on yourself. He knows about the guilt that other people will put on you because you're divorced. You see, He knows that. See all the reasons I believe God hates it? I mean, am I on track here this morning? These are things that God hates. And you say, well, we're not planning on getting divorced, preacher. Well, I'm glad of that. But you know what? This will help all of us. God don't want us walking around in guilt. Amen. Whether you get divorced or not, God doesn't want you walking around in guilt. God doesn't want you walking around limited in your service. 
He doesn't want you to bring reproach on your name. He doesn't want you to break holy vows. Amen? Number seven, another reason that God hates divorce is because it damages security. Especially the wife. Her physical well-being. I understand we live in a day of uh, feminazis, you know, women's lib, all this stuff, and that did not liberate women. It put shackles on them that they that don't belong on them. Okay. Amen. And I know that women are being taught they don't need a man and so on, but we all know that's not true. No matter how much the liberal uh, media and so on try to tell us, it's not true. Public school may teach it, but it's not true. When you get divorced, it damages the security of a woman. She's used to having somebody get up and check the sound at night. Amen? Now she's got to do that. Is that her place? Not at all. Amen? Let me tell you what else it damages. It damages your faith in relationships. I mean, is there such thing as a relationship that can glorify God and be sweet and though there's bumps in the road that it can recover and be a blessing to one another and to God. Is there a, such a thing as that? Well, when a person gets divorced, it burns them. I mean, let me give you an example here. What about how many times many of us as brethren, especially if you've been saved more than 20 years, how many times have we been burned by churches? How many times have you called the church, called the pastor, and you ask what they believe, and they tell you what they believe, and you go, and they sit down and meet with you, and they show you what they believe, and then about three or four weeks into it, you find out they don't act like what they believe, not even close. We're not talking about mistakes. We're not talking about people in sin that need to grow. We're not talking about that. We're talking about flat out, in your face, they're not like that anymore. They're not like what they said they were. We ever been like that? Amen. Absolutely. And then what's that do? Well, it ruins your faith in churches. These people that are in the home church movement, I don't know that I can really blame them. Though they are wrong, that is the wrong way to handle that. I don't know that I can really blame them in a way because they've been burnt too many times. Right? Well, the same thing happens with relationships. You get a divorce, there's no such thing as a you know, an uncontested uh, divorce that's not nasty. I don't care who you are and how you are. It's going to be hurtful. It's going to be painful. And it's going to make you distrust other people. God hates that. God hates that. You know, God gave us relationships. God gave us trust. Amen. You know what? It's horrible going through life not trusting people. Yeah. Do you know you have to trust people? Yeah. You do. You have to trust them. And here in our church, we ought to trust people. We ought to be able to trust each other. And we trust that we may fail, but when we fail, we, we recover. We get it right because God wants us to trust each other. God hates divorce, doesn't He? He says He does, first of all, but I think we're looking at some good reasons why. Well, number eight. Number eight. I very seldom have this many points to a message, but we're moving along. There's only 25 of them. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Roman numerals. It's not that many. Number eight. And I know that nobody seems to care about this anymore, but I do, and I think God does. God hates divorce because it violates the parents' wishes. I don't want to see my children get divorced. Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. I don't know how far we take that, and I'm not superstitious, but God is pretty clear here that dishonoring your parents is going to shorten your life. I somehow believe that the level you dishonor your parents is the level your life gets short, or the length. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a direct correlation. Boy, it sounds like it when he says that, doesn't it? You know, whenever a family gets divorced, or a wife, a husband, and there's kids in the loop, when the 
grandparents get involved, the grandparents are constantly having to soft step around both parties and around the grandchildren. You can't have a real relationship. You know I'm right. We totally destroy the kids' relationship with their grandparents. You know, I've always thought if my parents stayed together and we had children they grow up, I always thought if one of my kids were acting up or something and my dad reached over and said, now, hey, boy, we don't do that, I would like that. I would want him to do that. I, I want my kid to see the grandparent. I'm glad we had grandparents that were involved at some level. Uh, I'm thankful we didn't have to go, well, I'm with dad and his family this week, so the grandparents can't ever say anything or, or can't ever say, how's things at home? Hey, what'd you have for lunch today? Can't even do that because somehow that's construed of, oh, you know I can't afford to cook like you do. You know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to tell you, the pain of divorce contributes to putting your parents in an early grave. It does. Not just the divorce itself, but all the fruit of it. And all that they have to go through now. And half the time they end up becoming your daycare. And they've already raised their brats. And now they become your daycare. Right? Hurts the parents. Violates their wishes. Amen? Number nine. God hates divorce because it lowers the standard for your children. Yeah. You know, if you're any kind of parent and your kid signed up for baseball and he gets out there and he's not very good and decides he wants to quit, if you're any kind of parent, you're going to say no. You're going to finish the season because you started it and they're depending on you. If you're any kind of parent, that's what you're going to do. I don't know too many parents that have ever let their kid quit something like that because they try to teach them character. But yet, mom and dad can throw in the towel. And the kids, by the way, always think it's their fault. Doesn't matter. It's the nature of the beast. We know it's not their fault. But the kids think it's their fault. We've lowered the standard for our children. Mom and dad quit. They've given up. Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Christians are getting divorced and they're supposed to be as lights in the world. The thing is, is that children will usually repeat the same behavior. I hated the fact that my dad smoked when I grew up. I hated the fact that he smoked in the car. It was horrible. But guess what I started doing about age 13? Smoking. You end up doing the same thing. And then now, your whole life, you're, you're basically, till your kids grow up, you view your divorced parents as, as hypocrites. You see, we owe it to God, and we owe it to our children, and we owe it to our vow, and we owe it to our spouse that we may be sickened and upset with, Train those kids in the Lord by setting the example. See, God hates divorce. Man, is this not a practical message? <laughs> I almost went this direction at camp. Might have been too much for them folks. <laughs> Amen. Number 10, this will be my last one. God hates divorce for a lot of reasons, doesn't He? Number 10 is because it results in leanness. You see, when a person gets divorced, they're going to suffer loneliness. They're going to end up having problems just because of the loneliness. Many times they have bigger problems than the marriage was even. Because they're lonely. They suffer loss of possessions. 
I've never heard of anybody that's gotten divorced that didn't lose almost everything somehow, some way. They suffer the loss of self-worth. And you know what I mean by that. I, I, I don't believe in this psychology stuff. But immediately, when we get lonely, and we get tainted in the world's eyes, because when you're divorced, you're tainted. You would think by 2017 that we wouldn't be that way. But it's still the same, isn't it? We still appear to be tainted. Then you start wondering, am I ever worthy to serve God? Am I? Psalm 68 and verse 6 says, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. God can work anything out. He can work miracles. He does work miracles. But those that rebel... They're going to be in a dry land. A land of misery and loneliness. See, God hates divorce. And now, when you really think about it, now you see why. I bet some of y'all listening to this message, I bet you thought of reasons that I didn't mention today. I bet we could talk about it all through lunch. Why God hates divorce. Amen? God hates it. And know this. Do everything you can not to ever have it come your way. Or even knock on your door. When you start seeing things separating the wrong way, husband, jump in there, swallow your pride, and make it right. Whatever it takes. But I'm going to close with good news. That's the way I always preach. I always give the bad news first and then the good news. That's the way God does it, I believe. The good news is that divorce is covered by the blood. Hey man, if you're sitting here this morning and you've been divorced, this message is not against you. This message is for you. This message is for you. And you know, if you agree with me, that, that others, you don't want them to go through what you've gone through. Am I right? Hey Amen. I want you to know that you can seek reconciliation in your family before it's too late. You can forgive that you may be forgiven. You cannot get angry with God because He hates divorce, but draw closer to Him. You cannot try to turn your kids against the other parent. Amen? It, well, they do it to me. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. We're talking about us here. I want you to know something. The loving arm of the Lord will guide you. For He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. I believe if you've committed any sin before you were saved, and you have, or committed sins since you've been saved, and you have, I believe it can be under the blood, we can be in a state of revival, and we can serve God with all of our hearts. And we can be happy people. Divorce, it, listen, I know it makes us lonely. It results in leanness. I know it results in distrust and things like that. But through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the temple of the Lord where the Holy Ghost is in His temple called the church, my friends, I want you to know it doesn't matter what you've done, who you did it to, how you did it, why you did it. When you get right with God, that's made right with God and we move on and we love and we trust and we edify and we build up and we encourage. Amen. Amen. And that's what we're going to do here. And I'm glad there's victory even after divorce. But boy, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it's a hard deal. It's, it seems like an instant way to relief. Well, so does suicide. Suicide seems like an instant way to relief. But it's not. Amen. That's when the troubles begin there. Amen. All right. Well, we'll stop there. I hope that was an encouragement to you. We're going to be preaching probably on the family uh, for the next few weeks, just to strengthen us. And so the families that are joining us online and stuff can be strengthened. And I just pray today that you are encouraged. Let's have a word of prayer.